Today, I want to talk about communication. But before we go too far, I want us to think about what we're doing right now. Right now, I'm coming up with ideas in my brain, figuring out how I want to say things, and I'm sending those messages through the air via sound waves into your ear and onto your brain. We don't often think about speech and language as being profound processes, but today I want to show you that they are. As a linguist, and especially as a psycholinguist, this process of sending messages from brain to brain is the thing I spend most of my time thinking about. And the process is amazing to me because we do it quickly, efficiently, and without conscious effort. So even when we're not really trying, we do a pretty good job of understanding what people are trying to say. However, there are circumstances where this situation becomes a little more complicated. So imagine, if you will, that we're at a cocktail party. And there are lots of people milling around. And I'm trying to tell you this same story, but instead of a quiet auditorium, the people around us are trying to tell their very interesting stories to the other people in the room. And maybe there's some noise from the bar, people ordering drinks, glasses clinking, plates banging together, and maybe some background music all adding to the general din. I think we can agree it'd be harder to hear me in those circumstances, and understanding what I'm saying would require a little more effort. The process becomes more challenging as well if we vary who the talker is. So now imagine that a non-native speaker is giving the same presentation, telling you the same story, except maybe they choose slightly different words than you might expect in this circumstance, or maybe they pronounce things in a different way. Under those circumstances, it would be harder to understand the speech as well. Today, I want to explore why non-native speech is hard to understand and what native listeners can do to get better at this task and why I think we as native listeners have an imperative to try to do so. Understanding communication between native and non-native speakers is critically important for a lot of reasons. So, for example, uh, it's a commonly understood fact that the number of non-native speakers is greater than the number of native speakers of English worldwide, perhaps as many as three to one. Further, the US Census Bureau reports that 20% of people in the United States use a language other than English at home. What's more interesting to me is that while that number has been growing, so has the proficiency with which those speakers speak English. So yes, the number of non-native speakers is growing, but they're also speaking English at a higher proficiency than ever before. Unfortunately, this doesn't mean that the speech will always be easy for native English listeners to understand. And in fact, as I said earlier, non-native speech is harder to understand than native speech. And studies over the past several decades have given us some evidence about why that is the case. So, for example, we know that listening to a new talker is harder than listening to someone you're familiar with, regardless of their language background. And this is particularly true if the speaker doesn't sound like the people who we're used to hearing. It becomes even more challenging when that speaker doesn't sound like the people who we hear every day. And we think this is because people use expectation to help them understand a fast-moving speech stream. So let's go back to the example of speech and noise. Imagine you hear someone cough or clear their throat at the beginning of a word that sounds like it could start with a D or a G. Without context, it'd be pretty hard to figure out which word that is. But now imagine you hear it in the context of, please check the time and the eight or that cough covers up the ambiguous sound I was talking about before. In that context, we could probably fill it in with a D, completing the sentence, please check the time and the date. But imagine you hear that same sound in a different context. So for example, please close the latch on the eight. Here we're gonna fill it in with a G, completing the word gate. Psycholinguists have taken this and other related evidence as proof that we use our expectations to quickly and efficiently understand what's being said. But this process becomes more challenging 
when our expectations do not exactly match the speaker who we're hearing. So in the case of non-native speech, if a speaker is choosing words that are different than what we're used to hearing, or if they pronounce things in a slightly different way, we might not be able to use our expectations in the same way, and this might result in speech that's more challenging to understand. And in fact, we know that non-native speech does really differ from native speech on a variety of dimensions, ranging from how individual speech sounds are produced to how global patterns like speaking rate, speaking rhythm, and overall pitch patterns are made. All of this can make the speech harder to understand. But in addition to these acoustic properties, our social expectations can also impact how we perceive speech. So, for example, if you expect the speaker to be a non-native speaker based on, for example, what they look like, you're going to be less, uh, more likely rather, to perceive that speaker as being accented than if the speaker looks like somebody who you expect to be a native speaker. So if I give you the exact same speech sounds with two different faces as purported speakers, you're more likely to perceive the speech as being accented if you think the speaker is a non-native speaker, and you may, in some circumstances, be less able to understand that speech. That's pretty different than the speech just being hard to understand, right? Further, we know that biases, both explicit and implicit, impact a wide range of life-altering decisions ranging from who we want to be our neighbors and our tenants to who we hire for jobs and who gets convicted in a courtroom. Language is not immune to these biases. We know that our biases impact how we think a speaker will sound and how we are able to understand that speaker's message. One final piece to this puzzle is that how well we actually understood the speech and how well we think we understood it are actually two different constructs. So imagine I have you transcribe speech by a non-native speaker, and then I ask you how well you think you did on that task or how easy that speaker was to understand. Those judgments are not always correlated. In fact, in some of my work here at the University of Oregon with my collaborators, we've demonstrated that a pretty good predictor of how well people feel like they understood non-native speech is their attitudes toward non-native speakers not how well they transcribe the speech. Pretty surprising, right? So I've given you a series of really dismal facts. Uh, and maybe you're kind of sad now, thinking, OK, non-native speech is harder to understand for a wide range of reasons, from the cognitive to the social. Given these facts, how can we ever expect to communicate successfully with people with whom we don't share a language background? I have an easy answer. Practice. We know from work in my lab and work with my collaborators that you can get better at understanding non-native speech with just a little practice. So imagine I have you come into my lab for two days in a row, 30 minutes a day, just one hour total, and I have you transcribe a bunch of non-native speech. After those two days, I have you transcribe a new speaker. People who have done this practice before are markedly better at understanding a new talker than individuals who did not do this practice. Just one hour. We take this as evidence that we can get better at understanding unfamiliar talkers and unfamiliar accents. And this is true for a single talker. If you practice at that talker, you get better at understanding that talker. It's true for a single accent. If you practice with lots of different talkers, you get better at a new talker from that accent. And it's true across a range of accents, depending on the exposure during training. In my lab, one of the things we're most interested in and excited about right now is how to help native English listeners get better at understanding non-native non -native speech quickly and efficiently. Okay, okay, you might say as a skeptic, you're telling me I can get better at understanding unfamiliar speech with just a little practice. But what if I don't like practice? What if I don't want to try harder? Why can't that non-native speaker try harder? Well, as I mentioned earlier, unless you live in pretty isolated circumstances, you're going to be coming across more non-native talkers. 
In many parts of the world, English is used as a lingua franca, or common language of communication. And more people are learning English every year. More importantly, I would argue, non-native speakers are already trying really hard. They're meeting you more than halfway by learning your language in the first place. And any of you who have studied a non-native language can imagine the challenge they face every time they try to communicate in a less familiar language. Adding an unwilling conversation partner to the mix makes this task much more difficult and really unpleasant. One of my students has a metaphor for communication that I love, comparing communication to moving a couch. Of course, one person can try to move a couch, but it's going to be slow, it's going to be inefficient, and in some cases, it's going to be impossible. But if two people share the burden of moving the couch, the task becomes a whole lot easier. Plus, it's nicer to the other person. So I'm here today to ask native speakers to help move the couch. And as you do, recognize that the burden the other party is carrying might be heavier than it seems. Doing just a little work can help make our communications go much more smoothly. And this has implications for everything from casual social conversations to business interactions and serious political negotiations. Plus, it makes the world a kinder place, one that's accepting of diverse linguistic experiences and backgrounds. And who doesn't want the world to be a better place? Thank you. Thank you.